Hey guys, so standard five, this is our Articles of Confederation and our Constitution standard. Uh, this is the one where we mentioned the buildup from the cause of the American Revolution, and then finally the American Revolution does occur. And then with the win, it's the creation of the United States of America. So we now have uh, our own set of rules and our own government set up, and that's the Articles of Confederation. So under the Articles of Confederation, this standard breaks it down to where it describes some of the strengths of the Articles of Confederation, uh, but also some of the glaring weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation uh, that lead to the need for something else, and that something else is the United States Constitution. So as far as the strengths go, we said the land ordinance of 1785 uh, broke up the new territory into that grid pattern. Uh, so we said, you know, often you could, you know, have that first street, second street, third street, but it, it allowed for or encouraged uh, the idea of settling out west. So now this, the territory that was, you know, in conflict after the French and Indian War of the Ohio River Valley, uh, because of the proclamation of 1763, now this land could be settled. And, and really all the land uh, over to the Mississippi River could now be settled for the United States of America. Uh, under the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, you have where not only is the land uh, divided up, but now it's how do territories apply to become states? So how can uh, you go from just being land and uh, people living there to applying for statehood? Uh, so that process is all laid out uh, and that establishes uh, a precedent going forward of how territory can apply for statehood. Then you have uh, certain issues that were addressed, almost like preemptive strikes here. Uh, so the issue of slavery that was all you know, already problematic uh, was addressed and saying, look, this new territory, we're not going to allow slavery there. And that will take care of uh, the issue, at least in that area, public education. And this was, uh, you know, monumental. I know it's uh, something that we kind of joke about that you guys are not happy about, but it really is something that was uh, huge to have public education uh for the citizens and not just something that it was private tutors or, you know, something that was funneled through the church. Now it's uh, something that uh, could be available for uh, a lot more people for sure. That would be the strengths. And then that's basically the, the main strengths because there was a lot of glaring weaknesses. So uh, the inability to tax, inability to raise a, an army or militia of any kind under the Articles of Confederation uh, were obviously very problematic. No executive, uh, so no executive branch at all. That's, that's an issue to have someone enforcing the laws. So basically the Articles of Confederation kept our nation together after the American Revolution, uh, but it was, it was pretty obvious they needed to at least be revised. But obviously, we know that uh, they just get scrapped and we, we get the U.S. Constitution. And one of those events that we mentioned that lead to you know the idea that we just got to scrap these is Shays' Rebellion. So we've now at this point said Shays, weak government, whiskey, strong government. But Shays' Rebellion uh, would be you know when the, the farmers that uh, had the war debt were, or excuse me, the farmers that were in debt when they came back from war got to the point where it was uh, just enough is enough. And so they tried to take over the arsenal. And, and the main uh, kind of point behind this is that the federal government couldn't do anything. They, they you know, were basically powerless and reliant on the states to stop the rebellion. So that leads us to the Philadelphia Convention, historically will later be known as the Constitutional Convention. At the Constitutional Convention, there was two major compromises that we discuss based off of the standard. That's the Great Compromise and the Three-Fifths Compromise. So just to not get them confused, the Great Compromise was uh, dealing with representation. And this was representation between the small states and the large states. So mainly in terms of population. So the the whole process is well, you know, we don't want to have small states feeling as if they're not represented. Large states don't want to feel like, you know, their population isn't being counted. And so you have this great compromise where they come up with a bicameral legislature or two house legislature. So you have the Senate and you have the House of Representatives. The Senate, we have equal representation. So two senators per state. The House of Representatives is based off of population. So that's the great compromise. May I have your attention, please? All right, so the three-fifths compromise also has to do with representation, but the three-fifths compromise is where we discussed the issue between the free states and the slave states, meaning uh, those that were allowing slavery and those that were not. 
so mainly northern or southern states in this case. Uh, so the southern states did not want to put themselves in a position where because they had a lower population that they didn't get uh, didn't get a say or didn't get as much of a say as they would have liked. Uh, and so it uh, pushes southern states to say, well, we want to count our slave population. Please pardon yet another interruption. All right, so staying flexible here, uh, we are talking about the three-fifths compromise and how the uh, there was kind of some conflict there in terms of representation between slave states and free states. So the the compromise that is sorted out is well, we'll count three out of every five slaves in the population. So sixty percent of the slave population can count towards representation. So this was the three-fifths compromise. It also touches on the idea of limited government, so the uh, the checks and balances between the branches, so the branches themselves, but also the checks and balances between the branches and uh, the division of powers between the federal and state government, um, not to mention the local governments that the state government gets to uh, you know, in, implement. So this is the idea that limited government is put into place. The uh, federalist, would be very happy with this setup. They liked the Constitution as is. The Anti-Federalist were a little uh, apprehensive. They were a little concerned that if the uh, federal government gets too much power, then you know the states would lose out, and it wouldn't uh, work out with the idea of limited government like what was uh, initially planned. So. Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay write the Federalist Papers. So they write these series of papers and essays to get individuals to uh, ratify the Constitution. Because just because it was written doesn't mean that it is going to go into existence immediately. It's got to be ratified. The Anti-Federalist would have uh, felt very strongly that it should not be written in its or not be ratified in its current form. So the Anti-Federalist uh, were trying to convince people why they shouldn't ratify this. So there's a battle that goes back and forth. Uh, and the way that the two groups kind of uh, agree, or, or maybe the anti-federalists concede and, and officially get uh, the Constitution ratified by the states, is the Bill of Rights is added. So the Bill of Rights uh, protects the individual rights uh, of each citizen, as well as uh, it protects the state's rights to, to be able to not get uh, just run over by the federal government. So this was the way that uh, it came together and the Constitution is officially ratified and becomes the governing document of the United States of America.